Greetings, everyone, and welcome to second session of our program celebrating the publication of The Quantum Revolution, Art, Technology, and Culture. I'm your host, Peter Maravellis, and this session is titled From Particle Poetics to Wave Aesthetics. It will be moderated by Arthur Croker and myself. We are greatly honored today to have with us Rebecca Belmore, Ricardo Dominguez, Jackson Tubers, and Nadia Mir. This session will take the form of a panel discussion with the artists from the A to Z section of the book. They will be illustrating and elaborating many of the themes that emerged in our first session today. We're gonna to be exploring the concept of the quantum zone as a new way of understanding digital culture, as well as a series of reflections on art as a gateway to understanding the quantum imaginary. Uh, a little bit of background now about our session's participants. Arthur Croker is the author of The Quantum Revolution, a co-author, and uh, he's also the, an author, editor, educator, and researcher of political science and technology and culture. Uh, he serves as director of the Pacific Center for Technology and Culture, uh, located at the University of Victoria, where he served as professor of political science. He was the editor for online academic journal C-Theory, and also um, is uh, author of many, many books. Uh, joining him today will be Rebecca Belmore, an internationally recognized multidisciplinary artist. Her work is rooted in the political and social realities of indigenous communities. She is a member of the Anishinaabe Lak Sul First Nation. Uh, also on our panel is Professor Ricardo Dominguez, is the co-founder of the Electronic Disturbance Theater. He is Professor of Visual Arts at the University of California in San Diego, a Hellman Fellow and Principal um, investigator at the uh, Cal it to QI at the University of California in San Diego. He's also co-founder of the Particle Group and has received numerous honors for his work. Um, also with us today is Nadia Mir. She is a contemporary visual artist from Montreal, Quebec, an, Al an Algonquin member of the Kitigan Zibi Anishinaabe First Nation who lives and works in Montreal. Her work can be found in the National Gallery of Canada the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts, the National Museum of Fine Arts in Quebec, as well as exhibition spaces in London, Paris, and Greece. She is the recipient of numerous honors for her work. Also joining us will be Jackson Two Bears. He's a Kanyan Kahake Mohawk. Forgive me if I've mispronounced that. Um, he's a multimedia installation and performance artist and cultural theorist from the Six Nations, Tayan Dinaga, and who is currently based in Lethbridge, Alberta, in Treaty 7 Blackfoot territory. He has exhibited his work extensively across Canada in public galleries, museum, and artist-run centers, as well as internationally in festivals and group exhibitions. He is an active researcher in the areas of video arts, digital media, and extended media. Um, also, we have Lynn Barron with us, who's a wonderful photographer and was very instrumental in uh, the production of, of the book. Um, so to get this session started, I'd like to welcome once again, Arthur Croker. Welcome everybody. Thanks, Peter. Uh, Peter, I wanna thank you very much. That's a wonderful introduction and thank you personally for organizing the sessions and City Lights Bookstore, of course, the, uh, the favorite haunt of everyone that comes to San Francisco and a real shelter, a place for a shelter from the storm for one, I mean, it's just such a fabulous tradition itself. Yeah, and I'd like to, really thank the artists that have agreed to participate in this. Um, uh, Nadia Meyer and, and uh, Rebecca Billmore, Jackson Tubiers and Ricardo Dominguez. I mean, it's really, truly wonderful. This is a stellar cast of artists mm -hmm. and it's quite phenomenal. In the, in the first session for Nadia and Rebecca, I mean, when I went through the, the, you know, the genealogy of the book and talked about it, just really point out that your work from on has just had a phenomenal influence on my own thought and other uh, my collaborator and, as well as Lynn in drafting the book itself. I mean, Fringe, you know, the, Rebecca's image of Fringe begins the book. And the, what I describe as the, you know, the duality, it's enclosed in that, in its sense of, you know, such a hard vision of oppression on the one hand, and such a courageous and resplendent sign of solidarity and resurgence on the other. It just you know it just contains such energy and really just that that sense of of um, critical engagement just informs the book itself just as much as uh, Nadia's work in the scar project and the Indian Act which are just absolutely fundamental and are just for myself provided such important keys to understanding the entanglement of contemporary culture and the possibilities of art as a way of really understanding 
uh, things beyond purely technological points of view. And what I said in the first instance was that, you know, we're living in the, the vortex of the techno blast. And there's lots of things are moving with uh, no mass, but lots of spin. And bodies are made more vulnerable, but at the same time, they're overstressed. And that the only possibility for understanding the language of technology in any creative way, and I'm saying material to the culture in which we live, is by through resort to the art, the artistic imagination. And I mean, the, the work of uh, Natty Meyer and Rebecca Domar and Jackson DuPierre is truly just fundamental to the organization of the book itself, as well as a lot of other artists, like the performance artists, and the other visual artists, like uh, Kiki Smith and Louise Bourgeois, um, Rebecca, Bell, uh, uh, Rebecca Horn, and Nicola Feldman. Yes, there's lots of other artists, known and unknown, uh, within the book itself. So all this to say, it's just so fantastic to have three of you and Ricardo Dominguez as well, which is really just truly phenomenal. And I've known her, um, so, so that's good. So if is Ricardo there? I don't see Ricardo at the moment because I was going to begin with Ricardo. Hola. Yeah, because we're, hey Ricardo, yeah, because we're going to begin, I'd like to begin with Ricardo today and Ricardo, just sort of welcome to the session and thank you so much for taking part in it. I mean, I followed your work for so long, your work in the, you know, the electronic disturbance theater and the, you know, your, the particle lab. I mean, you're just really a breaking point artistically in really thinking issues of, you know, violence at the border and end and possibilities through simulation of doing something about it and stuff. So um, would you like to do some particle flips? Yeah, well, I, again, I'm... I'm really happy to be invited and um, to be with the community that has produced uh, the quantum revolution and um, I'm sort of the outside particle, if you will. Uh, but I, I thought I would just uh, attune the, the kind of quantum zone that uh, you're foregrounding uh, with Lynn and David and uh, just to speak a little bit about two gestures uh, one, the transporter immigrant tool in 2006. Uh, and here the particle flip is uh, taking what was a predominant uh, system that was e emerged in 2000 for civilians called global positioning system and shifting it into a geopoetic system. And uh, I always work uh, with uh, five or more artists um, over a 10 period, uh, 10 year period. Uh, and that sort of becomes the, the quantum site of making and unmaking. That is uh, how we assemble uh, the different zones of conversation. And my longtime colleagues, uh, Brett Stahlbaum, Amy Sarah Carroll, uh, myself, uh, Eli Mermad, and Misha Cardenas uh, developed this uh, transporter immigrant tool. It was a uh, tool for geopoetic sustenance and survival in the um, Devil's Highway. As you know, uh, part of the policy of the US is uh, prevention through deterrence to force people into very dangerous areas where uh, they can get lost, dehydrated and, and die. So it was uh, to open an iMotor ruler system that allowed one to find water uh, images as well as multiple poems for survival uh, in some 15 different languages. <clears throat> Since border crossers come from many communities, uh, we upgraded it into a Noikia system, <clears throat> excuse me, around 2008. It's a simple compass. It also has a haptic water witching tool that vibrates if you can't read uh, in terms of getting to the water and to sustenance. We also had information on the uh, Mexican side of the border on how to use the transporter immigrant tool. Um, we also got into a great deal of trouble with uh, the right wing Fox community who were very angry about the poetry it dissolved the nation uh, and the border, they said. We were also in trouble with the FBI for cyber terrorism, as well as my university and uh, other trials that we went through. Um, 
part of the process of creating this particle flip was to imagine that the code for the transporter immigrant pool uh, was poetry in the same way that uh, the poetry of sustenance and survival uh, that Amy Sarah Carroll wrote um, was also code. And this confused uh, Congress and the authorities in that code and uh, poetry could particle flip, poetically flip. Uh, we also wrote a series of plays uh, that constructed the different nativist bullets uh, that were used to attack us directly uh, during 2009 and 2010. Uh, we also created water barrels with the poetry uh, that were then set in the Devil's Highway uh, in order to support communities like Water Station Inc. and Border Angels. Uh, then, uh, flipping through time, um, in 2012, we began to investigate and you were there, Arthur, with Mary Louise, uh, dronology, how drone uh, culture worked at the University of San Diego, uh, University of California, San Diego. And one of the projects that emerged there was this system called the Pylon Drone. And this was a search uh, and sing system, a replica of the Predator Drone that's developed here at UC San Diego that would chase Homeland Security drones and sing to them the song of the border. Well, it took a long time to build this system. And of course, we went for more the Chicanex Rasquache system, which was just to put uh, um, uh, hobbyist drones with speakers and communication. Um, this is Electronic Disturbance 3.0. And um, we took these drones to the Mexicali um, a Calexico border. Uh, we set them loose. Border Patrol uh, was not happy with our feral drones and dronology and singing. Um, these flew above uh, the Border Patrol, offering music of the territory. Um, I don't know if you can see that, but they also uh, were quite uh, frightened by our antennas and our drones. I'll stop it there. Uh, and then we ended, uh, we were wearing these hats that we made called Make America Greater Mexico Again. And I'll stop there, a way to particle flip uh, different components of the border here. Thanks. And Ricardo, that was really, that was a really wonderful work. And can you talk a bit about the method of simulation that you use in your work? Well, one of the um, questions that emerged, uh, at least in, in the 80s, was to what degree was the relationship in this emerging performative matrix that data bodies uh, were going to be the value for virtual capitalism? And that virtual capitalism was driven uh, by a hyper simulation uh, space that only gave value to data bodies uh, and deleted real bodies from uh, the component structure. Um, what often then occurs in the gestures that we create, whether it's electronic civil disobedience or the transporter immigrant tool or the palindrome projects, is the sense that we can also create a hyper hyper simulation of the very components that often drive um, the sort of uh, performance of the border, uh, which is often uh, more the case uh, than the actualization of the border per se. Uh, so uh, a simulation is for us a way to extract the data body, uh, have it hit the ground, uh, and then manifest itself in a way that uh, uh, sort of um, allows uh, the particle flip between the poetic and uh, the code, uh, the gesture and the technology, uh, but they don't all uh, assemble themselves as being, um, how shall I say, the atomic facts of the um, uh, code, 
since the code is the poetry and the atomic facts of the poetry uh, since the poetry is the code. And that often becomes a difficult uh, space for authorities. Um, in the case of the transporter immigrant tool, this space of particle flip was where you had the FBI not investigating the actual tool or the code, but instead reading poetry. Uh, and so the FBI was very confused around what sort of uh, world, if you will, poetry was creating. I'm not sure of that difference of simulation. Uh, I think that'd be terrifying for them. I'm sorry, Arthur. That would be you. terrifying for them to. Oh, to have uh, the, the intervention FBI. of a poetic imagination. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I think that often happens uh, in the gestures. We try to disturb uh, what we imagine the code to be uh, and what we imagine poetry to be. And this kind of accelerator of the performative matrix um, shifts those particles, entangles them in other ways that is difficult for uh, the authorities to parse out in the way they want to, um, which is an important component of the aesthetic that we do. Yeah, that's fantastic. I really like the notion of particle. That's just a very powerful conceptualization. Do you see any, what other examples of particle flips do you see there in American? art that you're familiar with our American culture? Well, I, I think as many of the uh, areas that you were looking at with Lynn and David, and I was uh, listening to uh, the discussion earlier, certainly right now, uh, the key areas that researchers and our students want to focus on are um, different forms of AI, uh, XR or augmented reality, uh, different levels of virtuality. Um, probably the the key sensibility uh, here at UCSD is that, uh, for instance, with the question of AI uh, or machine learning, is that uh, the neoliberal agenda for that is that when you hear it on radio stations as you're you know uh, driving around, that AI is being presented by the market as being uh, hallucination free. You know, this, this AI is hallucination free. That's the marketing value. But what I often see with uh, the researchers here and our speculative design researchers is that they want to set hallucination free rather than be um, free of hallucinations. Uh, so there is a sense of co- making uh, with AI, uh, co-building with machine learning. And um, I guess the last thing I'll say is there was a novel written about the border, about an AI called uh, Quetzel. And uh, I'm a character in the novel who's creating Quetzel. I didn't write the novel, uh, but that's a, that was a strange kind of uh, notion to be a character in a novel. Um, but again, hallucinations as a co-making space, I think is uh, uh, something that's really important. Uh, augmented reality is, uh, again, another important composition that's happening right now as well. Um, I'll stop there. Um, so we can have... Yeah, so you're, or you're, I mean, that the, the present work is, is actually engendering hallucinatory logic. Yes. Yeah. I think that's the, because the market to me seems to be about AI being hallucination free. Um, and so if you're going to particle uh, flip, uh, what would be the sound of the aesthetic wave um, to co-make hallucination? That's very nice. So with that, then you're really looking at a world of artifice. Then. I think so. Uh, yeah. I was I grew up in Las Vegas and you can't get any more <laughs> hyper simulation. Uh, and so they trained me well. Uh, I learned from Las Vegas very early. Um, that is, you have a military entertainment uh, complex driven by casino capitalism, yeah. uh, simulation culture, aliens, nuclear weapons. Uh, so all of that sort of consolidates in these kinds of encounters, I think. Wow, that's fantastic. So 
so let me turn to Jackson then, because I want Jackson to speak, then I can come back to you, Ricardo. Because mm -hmm. Jackson's been involved in a project, not like to hear now what Jackson has to say, but Jackson's heading up a huge project and just got back from MIT. And, and the project is called Abundant Intelligences. I mean, it, it's a project that involves what, 17 countries and indigenous groups, artisans, 17 countries. It's really phenomenal. And I'd like just to hear from Jackson from an indigenous perspective, an artist's perspective of what notion of, of artificial intelligence is to work here. Great. Um, Sego, Sego Gons, Ganagoa. Uh... Jackson Degoni Yasan of Wale Unions. Shwe go nitu ageno ganya gahaga na wakon sonta. Hi everybody. Um, yeah, as uh, Arthur was just saying, um, I, I'm coming to you today actually from um, London, Ontario, in uh, the Dish with One Spoon uh, area. Um, back in my home territory, I just started work at Western University, and so um, having lived in Blackfoot territory for the last ten years. Um, very happy to be home. Um, but I just arrived actually last night. I was in, in Boston all last week, hanging out at the mothership uh, at MIT. And um, yeah, a very exciting um, working on this new project called Abundant Intelligences um, with uh, RPI, Jason Lewis, who's out of Concordia, and a number of um, institutions, you know, glo global indigenous uh, institutions around the world. Um, but um, actually to answer, or at least to talk about this, maybe I'll start, can I start at the end of what I was gonna say and then I'll kind of see if I can circle back around. Well, to the end of what I was gonna that. say was <laughs> <laughs> was about Iron Tomahawks, which is on the cover. So it seems a bit appropriate to talk about that yep. just briefly. And um, that was a project started in 2003, actually at the Pacific Center for Technology and Culture. By day, I was working, I had, it was the greatest job I'd uh, probably ever had um, working with Arthur as a research assistant. Uh, in 2003, just out of my MFA. And, you know, so by day, I was um, working on um, editing video with Arthur and Mary Louise and cutting together these kind of remix, uh, po sort of a mix of poetry and theory and doing these kind of uh, really interesting um, uh, pieces by day. And then by night, I was taking all this new stuff I was experimenting with at the Pacific Center during the day and kind of that's our Iron Tomahawks grew out of that. And at the end at night, I was, you know, sampling and taking stuff from Cowboys and Indians movies and mixing them together, uh, which eventually turned into this um, uh, VJ uh, piece that um, that is Iron Tomahawks and was, uh, you know, in hindsight, sort of looking back on it, I was remixing Cowboys and Indians and, uh, you know, anything else I could kind of source from, you know, Western movies and um, and uh, I was I was remixing myself is what I was doing you know, in hindsight. And so that's that's where I wanted to end up with what I was going to say. So let me start from the beginning. I was at MIT working and thinking about abundant intelligences and AI. And I will say that just at the outset, that artificial intelligence AI is a, a brand new research area for me. And, uh, you know, I certainly don't claim that I know a lot or maybe even enough about it. Um, but what I do know as an artist, I was finding, um, you know, aside from all the problems with AI, with, you know, copyright issues and stealing artists' works and uh, all of that stuff, the worst part about it was that it was producing some really incredibly boring art. And to me, it was, you know, based on text prompts and the like. And um, I know that that's an overgeneralization. I know there's some uh, newer, some fa fantastic things that have come out since then. Uh, but for me, I'd always, you know, thought if I was to work with AI, I'd want to kind of dig a little deeper and figure out um, where I was in the work itself. And so starting with the button intelligences um, to say that the core part of that was to um, begin to think uh, urgently about um, uh, indigenous knowledge systems, again, globally speaking, and the oncoming or already here uh, storm of artificial intelligence and what that means. And, you know, most of the time when I speak with people about AI, you get these kind of, um, you know, sort of, oh, it's going to be good. It might be bad. There's going to, you know, we're going to have to watch what happens and, um, you know, guide it in the right way. And, you know, Onkwe Hongwe, in, it, Indigenous people have heard this before. Um, we know all too well what it's like when new technologies come along and what that has often done 
um, to disadvantage us in our community. I'm, I'm speaking about, for instance, the fact that we still don't have high-speed internet on a number of our reserves, for instance. And so you can just imagine um, what kind of economic disadvantage that puts us at. Um, we can't even get clean drinking water on many of our reserves. Um, so speaking of, you know, um, AI and what it's uh, most certainly doing currently and probably going to do in its transformative capacity, um, there is an urgent um, need, I think, now to try to find a way to insert ourselves uh, into this conversation and to um, find ways that um, our ways of being in the world can be part of um, the development of these new um, AI systems. There's a small group of people, relatively speaking, that are um, um, at the center of the development of AI. And um, we want to expand that to some degree. Um, because we well know, um, and again, I'm stating the obvious here probably, is that um, technologies uh, are embedded with the worldviews of those that create them. And if AI, like others, are further embedded with um, uh, kinds of worldviews and ideologies that will continue to advance and reinforce uh, our current colonial situation, um, it's going to be devastating. <laughs> and so th this is kind of at the heart of what we're trying to work through, um, trying on the one hand to uh, safeguard and protect and, and hopefully um, our communities and ourselves, but also, on the other hand, maybe participate in the development of artificial intelligence systems such that, um, you know, on the one hand, you know, a AI has a very limited um, understanding of what even counts as intelligence. You know, uh, we, on Kwe Hongwe, talk about, I'm sure you've heard many times, us refer to uh, all our relations, right? Talking about the, the birds and the sky and uh, the trees. To us, all of which have life and all of which have spirit and all of which have uh, their own form of intelligence. And so it's that kind of thing that we want to insert into um, the conversation to say that, um, you know, we have this uh, view of the world, the living world. And um, I think it's really integral that it be part of our conceptualization. Um, so hence the, and hence the name, uh, abundant rather than artificial. Abundant intelligence is trying to think in this kind of wider scope. So where I am as an artist um, and what the project is, kind of the stage of the project right now is that we're just trying to start these conversations in our communities, working with our elders and knowledge keepers. Uh, and myself as an artist, I've been trying to figure out ways that I can work with AI. Um, as an artist, it's not enough to sit back and in my chair and think about it all day long. It's not even enough to really write about it. I feel like I need to work with it in order to understand it or at least kind of um, kind of come into relation with it. So uh, what I was presenting at MIT just this last week um, was a uh, I, I made a little uh, piece of software inside of a program called Max MSP, uh, which is the same software I used to build uh, Iron Tomahawks all those years ago. And this software, I used um, some uh, machine learning such that I could um, teach my little piece of software, my little AI, I could teach it Haudenosaunee drum songs. So I've got my hand drum, I just have it wired with a, like, a, um, uh, like a little MIDI drum. So it kind of wires and it reads MIDI into the computer. And then this, um, I can train this little AI software on my hand drum and uh, have it play it back to me. And I found this whole time, um, you know, I'm really used to, I say, I say to people, I'm an artist primarily and a computer programmer reluctantly. And usually that means that when I'm doing things like programming in Max MSP, I always run into, it's always about technical challenges, trying to get something to work, trying to get the scratch thing to work or something, video something to work. But this time, what was really interesting was that I kept coming up against not so much technical problems with the machine learning algorithms, but philosophical, spiritual questions. Like... If I'm trying to teach this AI how to be creative, well, what does creativity mean to me? How, where does my creativity come from? Um, you know, and and or other things like, um, uh, you know, sometimes when we go drum, if we, 
if I, if I go out some outside someplace and I'm going to go drum someplace out in the field, um, something we often do is, you know, we'll lay down some tobacco and give a gift uh, before, before we start to drum. Uh, and so I thought, well, if I make this AI and it's going to drum, it's going to learn my hand drumming, it's going to reproduce it. Well, maybe it needs to also give a gift. And then I thought, well, can an AI give a gift? Well, okay, I could program it. Maybe I could even build a little robotic arm and it could drop some tobacco down. But would the gift be authentic? Hmm. And then so I started thinking. And then so Jason Lewis, being uh, um, uh, the great thinker he is, he says to me, well, I'm telling him all this. Can I can I program the AI to give an authentic gift? And he says, well, think about it. You were kind of programmed too. Like your Haudenosaunee teachings are kind of a way of programming. You were learning these cultural contexts. So uh, back to what you said in the intro, Arthur, this idea about thinking, you can't think technology technologically. It could never have been more poignant when I was working on, with AI. That working with AI was a, a spiritual question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> A, a different kind of way of, of engaging it. Anyway, I'll, let me just wrap up with this because I don't want to take up too much time. But the last thing I did at uh, MIT, I, I did my drum and it played back to me and it was learning from itself and um, very rudimentary. Um, but I wanted to, it to be able to do something else. And I was thinking about my mentor when I was living in Blackfoot territory, Leroy Little Bear, um, who taught me a lot about interconnectedness and thinking about land-based knowledge and quantum physics. You'll hear Leroy often say, uh, my grandfather was a quantum physicist, you know, meaning wow. that quantum physics was now a Western science that was catching up to the way the Blackfoot understood the world as both wave and particle. And uh, Anyway, uh, when I first moved to Lethbridge, uh, Leroy, I met Leroy and he said, uh, so how do you like Lethbridge? And I said, oh, it's a bit windy here for me. And he sits me down and he says, Jackson, the Blackfoot learned a lot of their songs, medicine songs from the wind and from the thunder and I've thought about that ever since. And so when I went to MIT, I thought, okay, I'm going to train this AI on this Haudenosaunee drum song, and maybe I'll reverse it a bit. What I'll have it do after that is I'll have it produce a thunderstorm because this, these things are in conversation. So it's like uh, maybe the Blackfoot ancestors learning from the thunder. I thought maybe mine could speak back. So at the end of the day, at the end of the presentation, I, just with using video and audio, I produced an AI thunderstorm that was trained on Haudenosaunee drum songs. Again, kind of in a way to get out of this text prompting, in a way to, you know, maybe training AI on bird songs or on wind or other things is kind of where I'm finding myself a little bit thinking about AI and, and the way forward with that. And also uh, coming back to, um, you know, this AI thing I was making was not an in, a different independent intelligence, but was in fact a remix version of myself. See, I got to the end. That was good. I circled back. Around. <laughs> I should do that more often. I'll end with what I was going to say and I come back. And... Anyway, there you go. Hey, Jackson, that's absolutely fantastic. So will you be teaching the AI remix identity now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought actually the, I'm teaching a class right now at, here at Western called Landmarks. And um, mm -hmm. our students are doing a lot of uh, you know, so we work collectively and collaboratively on all these different projects. The first thing we did was um, we played a, a game of Snow Snake, which is a Haudenosaunee traditional game. We put cameras on the on the snakes and made a video installation out of it afterwards. But the last thing we're going to do um, in March, uh, March is the time of the Thunder Dance for us, the Wasaze, Thunder Dance for Haudenosaunee. So the class is sort of built around the Haudenosaunee calendar. So in, in March, I thought the students and I um, could try to produce an AI thunderstorm and they could help kind of do the maybe watercolor clouds and lightning and stuff. And then we're going to project it. Um, there's um, a new building here called the Wampum Learning Lodge, which is uh, an indigenous space of, uh, of learning. We have conferences there and our, our students meet there. And it has a dome. It's, it's a dome at the top. So we're going to project it up into the dome, this thunderstorm, uh, and try to work with the students thinking about, um, yeah, to try to reproduce that um, in the context of our, of our thunder dance. Wow, it's completely fantastic. So this would be like a, like Ricardo talked about particle flips. This would be your method would be a particle flip too. They're sort of parallel to one another. Mm -hmm. It's quite phenomenal. Well, that I think in terms of thinking AI, yeah, this is a pretty exciting misadventure, I would say, because it breaks the normal logic of things. <laughs> yeah, and points to something much more interesting happening. And I also like Leroy. Leroy Little Bear said. 
mm -hmm. uh, the Blackfeet were quantum physicists a long time before anyone else, which I totally agree with. Yeah. So it struck me the language of quantum physics is like a return to really understanding the natural world mm -hmm. and think about intermingling and entanglement and things. That's mm -hmm. really fantastic. Your work is really exciting, Jackson. This is really good. Thank you. It's really good. I yeah. Go on. yeah. And, uh, and I want to say um, it's by self designation that Nadia and Rebecca come last, <laughs> not the normal preferred way. <laughs> <laughs> So we'll turn to Nadia next. <laughs> and I might just, you know, just, well, it's just so great. And Nadia, do you wanna, do you wanna, do you wanna say anything about the Indian Act or SCARPA? These two, just because these two art pieces, art projects really figure importantly in the quantum revolution, as does your thought. Oh, uh, well, uh, okay, thank you. Um hard acts to follow. I, I don't know. I don't think about AI very much. Um, I think I'm working quite a lot uh, with these analog processes, right, of yeah. uh, making and handmaking and, and learning, learning and knowing intuitively. And um, I think and coming to understand as well. And especially with both the projects that you're talking about, Indian Act and the SCAR project. <laughs> um, And a lot of it comes down to, for me, uh, kind of understanding my own position as an Indigenous person within the world, um, and also within the inheritance that I have, uh, especially through my mother's experience of uh, being a 60s group survivor. And so in that way, um, you know, trying to understand what the Indian Act is, what it means, what it means to Indigenous people, what it means now, what it means what it meant then and you know what it meant to uh, my mother's you know history and story and then of course my own as a as you know coming from her right and living with her um i mean i think my original idea for that work wasn't to uh i wanted to do a big giant kind of bead work but i also knew that i i i needed to find something where I could kind of like do little by little and piece together. And, uh, you know, at the time when I was thinking about the work, my mom uh, had these kind of crazy performance art ideas of um, very much in the, in the spirit of your work, Rebecca, <laughs> of, you know, taking the Indian act and wrapping herself around it and taping it around a tree around parliament and, you know, uh, talking about, um, you know, in a way like the, the, the legacy and the and the violence right that that occurred from those um you know those assimilation policies right and uh but it, it turned into something else it turned into something communal where I invited other people to beat over the Indian Act with me and through that um you know allow others to kind of like reflect on the colonial relationship, both indigenous and non-indigenous people. And then a few years later, I was still thinking about my own wounds and trauma, um, but interested to see how other people might kind of consider what, what a wound or a trauma was. And again, looking to um, both, both to see if there was like some universal symbology around what, you know, how one might kind of depict a wound, um, both a physical or emotional or spiritual scar, but also um, in the words of, of, are there kind of these communal stories that we share um, in order to kind of, I think, situate my own. And so I did that project for over eight years and invited, uh, I think, close to 1400 people, both in the US, Canada and Australia to kind of sew a representation of a scar and then um, describe what that scar was. And it was, I think a lot in those kind of communal moments of working with others or working beside others as they were kind of doing those things um, that, yeah, just being able to kind of like sit with the experience of, of humanity in a way. Um, so, doesn't have anything to do with like these kind of um, 
you know, particle flipping. <laughs> well, I'm not so sure yeah. about that, actually. <laughs> it seems like a pretty important part, like in your own terms, it's a really important part of particle flipping because you'd, I thought it struck me that in, in, in a SCAR project, you know, I looked in Canvas after Kansas, saw that every, every Kansas was simultaneously a site of trauma, a depiction of trauma, the tearing of the canvas, pieces sewn onto it. But I thought, well, the communal nature of it was also a, an act of healing. So it did exactly what you do with trauma. As you know, Judith Butler says, you turn to go into the trauma and you begin to work it through. So I thought your art is really, this project in your art is an act of working through trauma, actually. It's particle flipping. And I really, <laughs> well, in a really, not in a tech way, but you know, just a deep, profound human way, a big, complicated human way. Right. I, I mean, at the end of the day, it's all about stories too. And uh, I think one of the ways to kind of like get over your trauma is to keep telling your story until you're sick of it. And mm -hmm. so the SCAR project offered that space, um, it, you know, until I was sick of my story as well. Right. Uh, I don't know how AI plays into that. I think it's quite interesting that, um, you know, we keep like feeding it these things, uh, to like spit out whatever <laughs> and most of the time it's just like pretty good goobly gook go go or you know it's like it's not refined enough you can tell that the machine kind of like just arbitraged a thing um to to be like here i think it's language um i'm i'm, I'm thinking a lot about that uh especially in the current work that i'm doing um, one of the things that I'm I'm researching right now is uh, going back to like the wax cylinders uh, that recorded indigenous stories and 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 people um, and trying to kind of recreate ceramic cylinders that could be um, embedded with a song or story uh, that could then be beaded. So I'm I'm making a lot of handmade ceramic beads in the studio that are woven together. Um, yeah, so that is that sounds like a beautiful project. It's slow going, but right now I'm right in the kind of material research of you know working through ceramic and doing all these kind of different ceramic tests. But in the in the beads or what sort? The beads. Or are... I'm making like all sorts of different sizes of beads, but you know, uh, right now I'm making kind of like large beads and uh, and then. Um, eventually being like inscribing, I don't know. That's a, I think it's a conversation that I need to have with Jackson actually. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's it's never here nodding like crazy. Oh yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. That's great. And there's another, you know, is, is your time. I was, I was thinking to the work of, it's another young person, Michael Ziegler. He's at Victoria. He's gonna be working down in Western Ontario I believe next year. And he's just completing a dissertation, which is blown me away. It's really good. And it's on artificial intelligence, really in the process of writing from an indigenous perspective. And the end argument is that, in fact, artificial intelligence is not particularly technological. Artificial intelligence is about languages of power, that we've always been artificial. We've always lived within the artifice of being human. And what defines being human is, of course, Western white settler colonial logic and things like this. So it strikes me that your work is deeply entangled with that, you know, that broadened conception of artificial intelligence of speaking to the violences and the trauma that results from the violences and also language of recovery in new forms, actually, new really creative forms. So in that sense, yeah. So particle flips are beginning to appear again. <laughs> That's really nice. Then the, the, I get you that for my own care. In, in the Indian Act, the beads themselves that you used um, the piece would their particular orders and what how did you order that in the different pages and things uh i think it, it was a very kind of uh one-to-one -one substitution as much as possible uh the beads that were you i was using at this at the time um you know weren't matching the font that i downloaded the indian act to but uh just kind of replacing the lines of text with rows of beads that correlated so in a way, it was uh, kind of a sort of eradication, but also a redress. Um, so wherever there's kind of like, you know, white words and black ink, 
our, our lines of uh, white beads. And then the space, the white page of the space is kind of like this undefined space, which is, um, you know, replaced with red beads. So mm -hmm. that, we're, you know, because we're talking about, um, to me anyway, we're talking about uh, inscribing a power to dominate a people in order to control the land, yeah. to control the, the red space, right? So, you know, as much as possible, it's about uh, destroying those people so that there's no issue about, you know, the territory and the lands that we live on. Yeah, terra nullius is over. Yeah, like empty territory and empty of people as well. Yeah, convenient life. That's in, in the very essence of Canadian law, actually. <laughs> yeah, that's really good. Anyway, Nadia, thank you, thank you so much. It was just really eloquent. And Rebecca, you've chosen to go last, <laughs> but in the in the quantum revolution, your work comes first, actually. I mean, fringe, which in the first session we showed images of fringe twice, and I talked about a little bit. I say, of course, you're going to talk about much more eloquently. Talk about fringe, and then the book also talks of eleven a series of your really fabulous projects, 1181, in memory of murder, missing indigenous women, uh, Black Cowed, about Neil Stimmingchild, and on taken on a starlight tour by police in Western Canada left in the cold, as many and as has happened to many other indigenous people for violence and stuff, and for the amusement of the officer. And also, you know, really, the book also talks a lot about wave, your project Wave Sound. With those fantastic horns in Grossmore National Park, Banff, uh, in Shigam Lake Superior. And now I was always really attracted. I thought, well, that's just phenomenal because not just the horns, the horns as forms of emanating sound, but ways of listening to the land again for the first time, listening intently to the land. So your work really, you know, in the writing of the quantum revolution it really figures largely actually unbeknownst to you well let's uh well thank you thank you and well going last i have to say i'm extremely overwhelmed right now <laughs> okay. um, what i've just heard and all those amazing works that uh that my colleagues and my artist colleagues were speaking about so, I, you know, I was thinking, you know, how I work as uh, an artist, I think is, I'm very, uh, you know, I'm trapped by my body and that my body is my vehicle and it takes me, it takes me to different places. Yeah. And in those different places, I try to locate myself and understand myself and understand how I relate to this place and all the other you know all all of our relations you know so it's really um how i function as an artist i think is to i just walk around you know and i take it all in i try to look for signs you know look for clues yeah for the making so for example fringe fringe you know with the beaded scar on the back you know the photographic work of a reclining woman. Um, I was walking through my apartment here in Vancouver, probably in 2003 or four, and I had the radio on and I was walking through the space in my own apartment and I heard this woman speaking and she told this story about uh, how when she went into the hospital for her operation, uh, she took her beadwork with her and to pass the time while she is waiting for her operation. And so then she went under and then when she came out and she's in the bed recovering, uh, she couldn't understand. She was confused by people were coming in and looking at her incision, like her wound. And when she was together enough, she looked down and to her horror, uh, she realized that the doctor the surgeon had stitched her own beads into her own wound. Wow. And that happened not very long ago. And so for me, walking through my apartment, you know, I stopped in my tracks and listened. 
and the show was over, CBC radio. So the, the show was over. So then I went off to do my thing, you know, live the rest of my day. But I carried that story with me for th about three or four years. And then I came to make French. So I, you know, I carried it with me, that story, until finally I knew what to do with it. And that's how I came to make French. So just listening to all of you, like, what what I saw, like I saw all that barbed wire, Ricardo, the, the, the border fence, and that really is amazing. It freaked me, it freaked me out while I'm sitting here in my chair in Vancouver. And Jackson, you know, I we spoke a bit about the early work of yours, and I remember, and you mentioned a few names of other artists that were in the audience. So then all those people come to my mind, which is really, you know, then it, that kind of made me happy. You know, so it's a contrast to the between good artist friends and you making this amazing work and then looking at this horrific border uh, barbed wire fence that's more severe than I remember it being when I was there in the early 90s. So that's really interesting. And then Nadia, amazing, you know, amazing, like the, I, I see the, I see the Indian Act beadwork piece. I've seen it a number of times, but then, you know, it comes to my head again, which is the beautiful, you know, that's the beauty I think of, of what we do as artists is, and that we have each other for, for company. And so I was thinking about like, how do I just, like this quantum thing work for me? Like, how do I feel about, I don't really think about it. Like I don't, I, what I what I do know is I don't like technology. You know, I don't know how to operate it. I don't know how to use it. I'm not very good at it. Uh, but what came to my mind is I made a performance a number of years ago. I was in Toronto, and I wanted to carry two pails of water from Lake Ontario up Spadina Avenue, uh, probably like a I don't know a kilometer or so. I carried two pails of water. But I wanted to carry my sisters, my actual blood sisters with me. And my sister Florine lives here in Vancouver. My sister Sally lives in Thunder Bay. I was in Toronto. So I asked them to go to another body of water close where they were living and to choose a stone that could fit into my hands. And I wanted them to send them to me and I said, well, my performance is like in two days, so you have to FedEx them. <laughs> so they did, and they chose two very different beautiful stones. And they arrived by FedEx. And then I took them to the Lake Ontario and I put, washed them in the water and I put them into the buckets, filled the buckets with water and carried it up the street to where I was gonna make my performance. But what, what I thought about when I was, you know, walking is like, well, these, these stones, these, these rocks that were selected by my sisters uh, from another body of water flew here yesterday. So I love that idea of stones actually flying, you know, in, in reality. Yeah. I don't know what else I want to say, but I just want to say how amazing you guys are. <laughs> hey, Rivet, which uh, which performance was this? Oh, I don't even remember what it was called. <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> I have to look it up. Yeah. And can you talk about wave sound at all? Yeah, that was um, that was a project that was uh, organized, um, you know, as a, to, to mark. Uh, Canada's 150th birthday. So there were a number of artists who did projects in national parks across the country. And so I, I, you know, I find it uh, really interesting how parks like protected, <laughs> protected territory for the, for the, you know, humankind's future, you know, for the good of all, you know, to enjoy. Yeah, I really thought, you know, I struggled with, well, should I work in this park or should I not, you know, like, is it a good idea or is it a bad situation? So 
I, I succumbed and I decided to, to make something. Uh, and it was, you know, when you have to, when you, when you deal with such, you know, immense beauty, which is the natural world, and you really actually look at it and think about it, it's quite overwhelming. You know, its beauty is so, so powerful. And then how do you as an artist, you know, how do I as an artist, you know, try to come up with something that is, you know, uh, is respectful. Yeah. Uh, and place it out there on the land. Like yeah. that was really that was a really hard project for me to come up with something that I could feel good about in the end. So I struggled with that. So in the end, I made those those cones with the help of many people. Uh, uh, so I made those cones and they're made from taking um like a a silicone mold of the the rock in the park itself. And those were <clears throat> transformed into uh, cones. So it kind of carries it carries the the surface or the skin of the the rock on which it's placed back on top of. So it kind of comes. It is of the land. Uh, it's of the rock. It's of that stone. It carries all the you know all the scars of the land, you know, of the rock itself, the veins, the cracks. And uh, so the cones are quite large. Uh, they're different scale, but uh, they're, they're larger, as large as uh, our bodies, you know, as large as a human body. And then the idea is that you just put your ear to the, to the end, the small end of the cone, and you listen to the, you struggle to, <laughs> to listen, to really listen, because it's, it's well you you expect to hear something you know fantastic and then it is fantastic but it doesn't sound like you think it's going to sound because of how the how the air moves and in the shape itself and whatever else is going on in the environment it all gets kind of mixed and it sounds like an amazing atmospheric kind of strange kind of music of some sort so it was really an, an interesting project in terms of trying to get people to stop and get down on the ground, get down on the on the rock surface and put their ear to these uh, aluminum cast, you know, cones and listen, try, try hard to listen. Wow. Yeah. So it's really the amplitude of sound in terms of the wavelengths of sound. Yeah. It's, it's a totally phenomenal project. And then the other side of that would be a project you did uh, rising to okay. The first work I saw of yours was rising, rising to the occasion. The beautiful Victorian dress that's also a dam, Ben Beaver Dam. Yeah. And I it struck me because I that was on it was Beardmore. No, it was in, in Thunder Bay. Oh, Thunder Bay. Okay, great. Yeah, and I come. I grew up actually very close to Thunder Bay. So okay. I, yeah, so I always found you a kindred spirit. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> yeah, that's, that, that work was made in response to the a royal visit. So when Prince Andrew and Sarah, his new bride, Sarah Ferguson, flew into Thunder Bay. <laughs> <laughs> they were there for about six hours, and then they, then they took off. <laughs> yeah. And, that's, and you did a parade down the street with other women? Yes. Yeah, I wore my Victorian ball gown, you know, beaver house uh, on, this, on the main street of uh, downtown Thunder Bay, Port Arthur. Yeah. Uh, and then the royals were at a reconstructed historic fort called Old Fort William. So <laughs> it's like simultaneous. Like yeah, it's, it's nostalgia for nostalgia. Two performances going on. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, dual performances. Yeah, it's fantastic. And your your work also has been chronically really beautifully and uh, uh, facing them on the the your the retrospect of all your work at mm. the AGO, the and the catalog, particularly facing the Monumento, which is edited by uh, Wanda Nanabush, mm -hmm. who's now been basically fired by the AGO for having temerity to speak about Palestinian justice and things. So, yeah. Uh, quite the story. <laughs> yeah, quite the story. Yes, and, 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 and 
That was writing this phenomenon that that catalog is really a wonderful catalog. So all of this to say is that in the quantum revolution, your work figures large. Okay. It's just a huge impact in your, I learned so much from your perspective, actually, like your depth of perspective and depth of listening. Well, so. I'll have to look at the book. Yep. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> Under bed in my sister's basement. I haven't. Oh, your sister. <laughs> well, at some point it would be good. So it's great. So, um, d does anyone have anything to say to any of the other artists over your in the session? If not, we we'll see if there's any questions. Peter. Yeah, we have uh, some questions coming through. So Lucy asks, "Are there colonizers in AI?" Territory, real or virtual, is still territory. Um, <clears throat> well, I, I think one of the elements that we, all the artists are dealing with is uh, how do you particle flip uh, the histories and uh, colonization that um, is in the material in the lived realm uh, does it echo or directly impact the virtual? Uh, yes, I would say it's uh, deeply imbricated and entangled. Uh, but as we heard with the gestures that each of these artists has made, and specifically the way David Lynn and Arthur and Quantum Revolution uh, set their work as uh, this space that counters, contests, shifts, and amplifies other ways in which those territories uh, aren't um, uh, directly uh, echoing, uh, but are allowing something else to occur. Um, I think that's uh, quite an important space uh, to consider, uh, not to have it signposted as automatically colonized. It's a good response. Other I responses, could, Jackson? Yeah, I, I could I could try to say something. Um, and uh, so at MIT last week, I gave a presentation. And this uh, person, uh, who will go unnamed, uh, asked me a question, but was clearly very upset at me. And, uh, and the whole time this person was talking, I thought, wow, I must have given a really fantastic presentation for her to be this upset. <laughs> Uh, and her her problem, I think, was that um, she wanted to insist on a real distinction between AI and us as human beings. Wow. He kept saying over and over again, the the human the human brain is not a computer. And it was just insistent on and and to some degree, I, I, I agree. I mean, the, the, the computational processes, there's differences in organic matter, and all, I could agree with her to some degree. And once she was done, I said, "Well, you know, zooming out a little bit, um, you know, the whole idea of separation and distinction, you know, and the insistence on always saying as individuals we are separate from this other thing or we're different from this other thing, and the insistence on that." is, um, you know, to a large degree, uh, not something that was, you know, integral to our way of thinking as Onkwe Homeway prior to colonization. We didn't think of ourselves, I'm told, as distinct and separate from the land from which we came, the birds, the trees. We were, as Leroy Little Bear goes on and on about and tells us, teaches, reteaches us about our interconnectedness with the world and the universe. And so, you know, we you'll hear us say all the time, talk about our traditional territories and ter but even the ideas of territories, these kind of demarcated spaces and kind of are, are so somewhat a new way of us talking about our, you know, it's it's kind of in response a little bit to these ideas of ownership over land and space and all this kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, I think that insistence is another one of those ways in which those uh, colonial ideologies have made their way into AI and VR and AR spaces as a way to claim and own and all of that sort of stuff. And so perhaps if there's a resistance that I would like to be part of uh, would be about un undoing that and, and finding ways to, uh, and under understanding really how we are already interconnected 
with those things um, uh, on a deep kind of level, um, and, um, uh, and and just and work from there rather than again kind of insisting on this kind of separation or territorialization between us and other things and uh, within inside of that space of ownership and and whatnot. Um, you know, I like to think about things in relation. I suppose maybe I'll end there. Nice response. Nadia or Rebecca? I like to think about things in relation to you. <laughs> Thank you for that, Jackson. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Uh, Peter? Yeah, we have a, another question from Michael. As we begin talking to other intelligences in new ways, how do you think that will impact our relationships more generally, not just homo sapiens to homo sapiens, but homo sapiens to animal, to forest, to AI. Well, again, echoes uh, of the work that um, is being presented. Uh, and you know, one of the qualities that, at least for electronic disturbance theater, was uh, that working in the 90s with the Zapatistas in Chiapas, Mexico, uh, we were able to create uh, electronic civil disobedience, not as a technological condition of cyber war, cyber terrorism, cyber crime, but as an indigenous cyber poetics. Uh, and that really shifted what electronic civil disobedience would be. Uh, so that there was an intimate uh, relationality, as uh, uh, the other artists have spoken to, between the data body and the, and the real body. Uh, they were both human and machinic at the same time. Uh, so I think it's an, uh, an interesting dialogue uh, of trying to co-make, co-build, co-create uh, with these systems. Uh, and again, for me, it's always... Uh, 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 a sense of uh, taking in the Zapatistas uh, in terms of uh, thinking out these questions, um, which at least for me was really important in terms of the poetic, so that the particle flip is always from, uh, if they give you uh, global positioning systems, uh, you give them geopoetic systems. Uh, this creates the disturbance that particle flips, uh, the condition of the dialogue, if you will, um, rather than a division or a wall, Bob wires, as you will. That's right. Yeah, and I would, I would just add to that, I don't know if it's possible for a book to listen intently, but I did tell you the quantum revolution was written in a new way. It, you know, as one of the authors of the book, it was one of the ways of listening to the book, of trying to listen really, really intently, was to listen to the language of stars. There's a lot of stories, a remarkably large number of stories in this book about astronomy, stories like uh, blue stragglers and gravity waves. And those come out of real just meditations and listening intently to the language of the cosmos. And they are written under the sign of the cosmos, of trying to have a form of thinking which opens itself up to the language of, 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 of earth and fire and water, of, you know, the, of the four humors themselves. So I don't know if it's in, in response to the question, I don't know if it's possible for books to listen, but the quantum revolution is written as a listening book. It's listening to a lot of sounds. Some of the spasm sounds that go on within our culture on the one hand, this, you know, culture and technology, but also is intently written to listen to the nature that is around us and to the cosmos that surrounds us and to try to find a way of putting that into words itself. For example, one of the stories is a short story, and it's an essay about um, Lynn and I wrote for a walk one day in Cadbro Bay and Victoria. We go around Ben, deserted beach, beautiful tree, arching into the water and the base of the tree has a beautiful granite stone. And then we look again and realize that the granite stone, which is every day washed over by the tides and it's under the water, has a beautiful sign of with the Scorpio, which is chiseled into it. And a love story, 
basically, which is chosen into it itself. So really, I thought of my, when I saw it, I thought of myself, I thought, of, well, just the play of the seasonal variations and the movement of the tides and of the water and where are the origins of the story and what are the possibilities and of uh, granite, you know, just, you know, it's, it's um, stubbornness and it's stubbornness and it's endurance with this and stuff. So it became like a short story, which for me was a beautiful story of remembrance and all this based on stumbling across the granite stone, which is just at the tide head really itself. So this is a book of, for myself as an author, it's a new way of writing for myself because it's really writing with a lot of intent listening going on in this book itself. So that's just in response to the question. Okay. Anybody else? So Peter? I, I can't think of a better way to end it. Arthur, thank you so much. And, and honestly, it has been such a pleasure working with you over the years. We have had so many great times. And, and I think that this book and, and this moment, um, the fact that you've brought us all together, I mean, it has been such an honor having so many of you in the room tonight. Uh, Rebecca Belmore, Ricardo Dominguez, good to see you after so many years. I remember our, our Paul Virilio event so clearly in my mind, Nadia Mir, Jackson Tubers, you're all doing such incredible work and we're really just very honored to have you in the room. Um, I wanna remember and remind everyone we have posted links. Actually, uh, if you wanna learn about any of the artists today, we've posted links in the chat. Please do go to those links and learn more about their work. Um, also, as previously mentioned, we posted uh, links with which you may purchase books. Uh, of course, if you're in the hood, please come on down and visit us. We're located in San Francisco's historic North Beach District. We're open from 10 a.m. till uh, 10 p.m. every night, getting back to our pre-pandemic hours. We are the ultimate browsing experience. We have a lot of critical theory, books on indigenous culture, um, all kinds of stuff you will probably not find in other bookstores. That's what we're all about. So please come on down and visit us if you're in San Francisco. Um, today's program has been made possible by support from the City Lights Foundation, continuing the legacy of our founder, the late Lawrence Ferlinghetti, through public events like this one, our publishing program, and educational outreach, all dedicated to sustaining a vibrant community of readers, writers, and critical thinkers. So thank you all so much. Please take care. Please be well, stay safe. We hope to see you all again very soon. Great. Adios. Thank you. Have a, have a go Thank on. you, everybody, for participating. It was a real honor. And your, every presentation was just absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. Hola. Have a go